The most important thing to do well in Section 3 of the GAMSA is how you approach problems. Unfortunately, doing this well is one of the things that most people find very, very challenging. So in this video, I'm going to show you in three steps how I approach GAMSAT problems and how you can implement these things to improve your approach as well. Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name's James, I'm a second year medical student and also a GAMSAT tutor, having scored 77 in Section 3 and 70 overall. I really enjoy tutoring the GAMSAT as it's a very complicated exam and to do well it requires integrating a lot of different skills. Through my tutoring I've noticed that a lot of people struggle with the same stuff and that's why I made this channel was to go through some of those really common mistakes that I see people make around approaching questions, problem solving, some of the more basic kind of mathematical and science skills as well. So if any of that sounds interesting, please consider subscribing to the channel to make sure you don't miss any of my future videos. However, today we're going through how we approach GAMSAT problems. Now, as I mentioned, a lot of skills are required to do well in the GAMSAT. However, I think how you approach problems is actually the most important thing for doing well on the exam. The reason I say that is probably for two, two main reasons. So the first one is if you can efficiently uh, get through a problem and work through it, you're going to save a lot of time. And if you've sat the exam before, you know how much of a factor that time pressure is. Secondly, and probably more importantly, is that I really think GAMSAT problems are about an in-depth understanding of quite a simple concept. Now to do that, you really need to understand the information that they've given you and apply it to a problem. Now, having a really clear thinking process and seeing how that information relates to that problem is what is required to, to show that in-depth understanding. So if you don't have that clarity of thought and ability to understand the information that they've provided, it's going to be very hard to apply it in the way that they want you to. So if we can efficiently work through problems and the information and the STEM and everything that they provide us, it's really going to help us get through it quickly, but also be able to apply it to the problems that they give us. So this is the exact approach that I take to questions, and it really revolves around three main things. So we'll start off with the first one, which is skipping the STEM. So when we think of GAMSAT problems, there's a big STEM of information which usually has uh, a lot of words, maybe a graph, a table, maybe both. It's usually very, very long and verbose. And in my opinion, that's there mainly to distract you. So although there is relevant information in there, it's kind of your job to be able to go through that information and pick out what's, what's relevant. And as I mentioned before, GAMSAT problems are really about showing that depth of understanding about simple concepts. So there's going to be a simple concept that they're examining and then the information they provide you is going to be something that you use with that concept to then solve a problem. Now as I mentioned before the STEM is usually full of words and I often find that it's intentionally confusing. So they're putting things in there that are relating to different terms so that's trying to confuse you. Some of the words are a little bit vague, they might be leaving a few little things out and really, overall, the STEM is not there to be your friend. Yes, there is valuable information in there, but it's not really like an instruction book. It's actually there to detract from the information. And the reason I think they do this is if you think about a doctor, for example, because at the end of the day, this is a medical exam, and I know the GAMSAT has its flaws, but the intention of it is to pick people who will be good doctors. So if you think about why they might be doing it, that can also give you a bit of insight to why they're designing the questions this way. So you think about a doctor, they're getting a new patient, they're going to get a lot of information about that patient, and they might need to decide very, very quickly what's going on with that patient. So they need to pick out the relevant details and then use those details to solve a problem which is very, very similar to what I'm saying that we need to do with GAMSAT problems. So there's relevant information there, but there's heaps of stuff trying to distract us. So that's why I say skip the STEM. It's not your friend. And when you skip the STEM, that means you go to the question. And what I like to do is kind of use that question, summarize it really well, find the key words, and then use that as a filter 
for the stem. And I find that just makes everything so much quicker in how you actually approach questions and work through that massive amount of information. Another analogy that we could draw here is imagine you're at work and your boss tells you to create a summary of a 500 page document, a one page summary. It's kind of impossible to summarize that whole 500 page document into one page. You're probably gonna ask questions like, what do you want a summary about? Do you want a summary about the, the background information, about, I don't know, the financial information or something like that? And with that context, it makes making that summary far easier because you can skip parts of that document and find what's relevant and then condense that. And again, it's about condensing the relevant information into something that's quite useful and shows that you actually have an in-depth understanding of that particular topic. Now, I get pushed back on this all the time about people thinking that they're going to miss something. Fair enough. However, I would just say, as you're going through, do a little experiment with yourself. So go through and read the stem and then read the question. And I guarantee that after you read the question, you're going to be going straight back to the stem anyway. Now, if you've read the stem and you've actually understood it well enough, you shouldn't need to go back to it. So the fact that even after reading it and then you read the question, you still need to go back to the stem shows that that's just a completely useless use of your time. So don't do that because you're actually not understanding the information well enough to be able to apply it to the problem at hand anyway. So you may as well start with the question, use that as a filter, and then once you've filtered it down into less information, you can spend more time on that information so you actually can understand it well and can apply it to the problem. Okay, so that's the first part, which is about skipping the problem and using the question as kind of a filter to find relevant parts of information in the text. And that brings me on to my second point, which is articulating the problem. So this is also going to start with the question as well. So I want you to spend a lot of time with the question before you go back to the stem to really make sure you understand what problem is actually being asked. So there could be a number of different things. And on face value, again, much like the stem, the way the question is worded is not always that clear. So look at the, look at the question, look at the options, and try to figure out what you need to do. So for example, if you have numbers as the options or something like that, you know that you're going to need to calculate something. So that means that you're, if you're going to articulate that problem, it would be, I need to calculate whatever, okay? Whereas if you need to, uh, if let's say you've got some variables in there or something like that, you might think, okay, well, I need to represent this variable in terms of these other variables. So that's a completely different problem. So really, we want to spend a lot of time with this, with the actual question that they're asking us and articulate that into a problem that we can directly use that information that we find from the stem to apply to it. So these two kind of go hand in hand. We need to define the problem really well, find the keywords, and then use that as a filter in the stem to find all the relevant information for that problem. If you're enjoying this video, please consider liking the video as it really helps me grow the channel. Okay, so moving on to step three, which is think of a time that you've done something similar. So what I mean by this is we've gone through, we've skipped the stem, we've gone straight to the question, we've articulated the problem, and then we've also found some keywords and maybe found some ideas that we want. We've gone to the stem, used that as a filter, found all the relevant things, but now we actually need to apply that information to get to one of these answers and solve the problem. And a really important step and something that's very, I think overlooked, but very valuable is what I said before of thinking of a time that you've done something similar. So what I mean by this is just come up with whatever your problem is, try to think of something related to it. So I had a student the other day and they just had no idea how to progress with, with this problem. It was about the rate of decay of some, uh, some ion or some molecule. It doesn't really matter, but they just kind of felt very, it, it felt, it couldn't really go anywhere 
because they said, I don't know anything about this compound. I don't know anything about half-lives and things like that. And I just kept pushing them and pushing them and saying, can you come up with a time where you've lost something or something's degraded? Because that's ultimately what they could identify on the graph. And they said, oh, well, actually, I work as a nurse and we have a drip, a drip bag. And it, you know, some of the stuff in the bag goes into the patient. So that goes down over time. And then I said, okay, well, how would you calculate how much of the bag you've lost? And then she very quickly came up with a way that she could calculate based on the volume of the bag and the time. And then from that, I said, okay, well, now you've actually proven to yourself that you can solve the rate of decay, which is actually exactly what this question is asking. So if you can now relate all these other parts of the question to this thing that you know really well, then you've actually solved the problem. And that's exactly what happened. So she ended up relating the time to the, obviously that's still the same, but then related the concentration of whatever compound to the volume of stuff in the drip bag, and then was able to work out what mathematically you'd be able to do. So she knew intuitively that to calculate the rate of decay, you would divide how much is gone by the time, um, but couldn't quite connect the dots when it was in a chemistry example. So I think if you don't underestimate your own real world experience and use that as kind of a basis of truth. So if you can actually know how you would calculate something like that in real life, you can then apply all you need to do is really just match up the things in the question which with the thing that you know how to do in real life and then you've actually solved it completely. Okay, so to summarize those three steps, we want to skip the stem and we want to go straight to the question to find all the key words that we're going to use as a filter for the stem. Secondly, and kind of concurrently with that, that step, we're going to also define the problem really well because that's also going to help us filter certain parts of the stem out for if they're relevant or not relevant. Once we've done those two steps and we've found what we think is relevant and we actually need to apply it to the problem at hand, we then want to think of a time that we've done something similar and try to apply the same process. So I'm going to demonstrate this with one of my own practice problems just to show you how that might look. Okay, so here's an example of a question I've made and I'm hoping that this will be a really good way to put everything into context about what we've, talking, what we've talked about with how to approach questions. So as we look at it, this is obviously the stem and you can see that there's a lot of information. Now, just to demonstrate my point, let's pretend that we didn't listen to my advice and we actually read through that stem. Now, I'm not gonna read it out for you word for word, which is probably music to your ears, but just have a look at some of the language that's used here and which parts you think are going to be relevant or not relevant when we're actually um, solving the problem. There's also a lot of uh, words in here that are very difficult to understand. So things like dynamic velocity, you know, what is that? A metacrit level, what's that? Um, laminar flow, you know, these are all words. Now I made this question, but the reason that I put those things in was to try to get people to spend time trying to understand what those mean, even though they actually have literally no impact on the question. So the only thing that you actually need, as I'm sure you can kind of, as you're having an outsider look in, uh, this is probably going to be the thing that we actually want to spend the most time on, is understanding the equation. Yet there's all this stuff here, and if you just put yourself in the shoes of someone reading this question, it'd be very easy to freak out when you see all of these terms, because you think you don't know anything about it. Okay, so, if we go, let's say we take my advice and we skip this down, we go straight to the question. I might not spend too much time on question one because I find it's quite obvious when you read this that you're going to need to be doing some kind of calculation. So this isn't the best example of how to approach questions because that's quite a well-defined problem anyway. But something that might be a little bit better is something like question two here. So which variable in the equation would most significantly affect the blood flow if altered slightly? So we've already got some things that um, 
we need to define. So we've got significantly affect the blood flow. So that's obviously going to be different. And it's told us to look at the equation as well. Okay, so just think about that and then compare that to how we first went through the stem to how we're now going to go through the stem. So when we go here, we're automatically going to be taken to the equation because it told us that the equation is relevant. And we're going to be looking for things like uh, like that's, we think, okay, Q is going to be relevant because that's um, blood flow through a vessel. Uh, and then it's got all these other terms. Okay, so that's how you can kind of use, that's kind of the first two steps in action. You skip through, you define the problem really well. Uh, well, we actually haven't done that quite yet, but we've kind of gone through and we've found the keywords that we can now use that to filter out what's important. And if you kind of just read this, just skim over this paragraph quickly, you can pretty almost immediately say that none of that is going to be relevant for us. There's nothing that kind of has similar keywords. It's more talking about laminar flow, viscosity, that kind of thing. So that's the value in it is that you can immediately discount things. Now we really need to define this problem. So we need to Really, if we're going to define that, I like to reword my problem. So I like to think, okay, what's going, what well, this one's actually quite well defined as well, but you know, what's going to affect blood flow the most? So it's, give me all these variables and I need to determine which one has the biggest effect on that. So we get up to the equation and we think, okay, well, which of these variables is going to have a greater effect? So this is where you can ask yourself, when is the time when I know that a variable has had more or less of an effect on something. And I'd be thinking, okay, well, if I had, let's say, uh, y equals, I'll type this in here, y equals x plus z or something like that, I would say, okay, well, each of x and z both affect y, but which one would have more of an effect? Well, it kind of depends on what's in front of those variables. So the question implies that it's going to be a slight change. So it's kind of, I'm interpreting that as there's an equal change in all of these variables, which one's gonna have the biggest effect. So then I think, okay, well, in this case, they're gonna be equal, but what's the situation when they wouldn't be equal? Well, if this was y equals um, 10x, plus z, well, I can see that if I change x, that's going to have a bigger effect on y. So I, th I might think, okay, well, if I look down here, you know, there's an 8 down here in the denominator, then I'm like, oh, actually, what about this power? That would have a far greater effect. So that's just kind of a way that you can create a really simple example and try to use that as the basis of truth that you can then look at your equation or whatever problem you've got and then hopefully be able to figure out what the answer is from there. So in this video I've gone quite general in terms of skipping the stem and using the question as a filter to find information in the stem which is relevant. However I've also made another video documenting my three words rule which is an approach that I use to actually find that relevant information and summarize the keywords in the question. So if that sounds interesting to you, I'll leave a link somewhere on this page or in the description. But otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, please like, comment and subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.